now move on to the first session of today. I see you've got uh, questions all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, my second question, but I could never forget Deoli. Not after one night many years ago. You write that in the night train uh, at Deoli. Uh, I myself first read this story 30 years back when I was in school and the lines have stowed on. Has this story been inspired by some real life incident? Night train at Deoli. Now, this is a short story I wrote. In 1956, <laughs> in my very romantic 20s, when I used to fall in love with any pretty girl I saw either at a bus station or a railway station, um, and for, and I couldn't have fallen in love where we are now because uh, Gurgaon was a bit of a wilderness then. But um, true, Nitrinid Dioli, in a way, is the essence of my romantic period and young people today often who read the story often ask me did you really fall in love with that girl did you get down on the train again did you find her and um, i have to say that um, if she's still around well she'd be she'd be around my age in her 80s and i don't think we'd recognize each other <laughs> but um, Still, it, it, it was a, a story that seems to have survived. It's nice to know that people still read it. I looked at the windows of my house and at the windows of all other houses in the street. Mm. They were all in darkness. It seemed to me that we were the only ones who had really celebrated Christmas. You wrote this in Calypso Christmas. Mm. Why do you think was life so dull, lonely and boring during your London stay? Well. <coughs> Life in a big city can be lonely for a stranger. If, when I came, in fact, to live in Delhi in the 60s, it took me a few months um, to, to make friends. But um, in a big city like London, it was even more difficult because I did not know anybody there. Um, and then I met these uh, West Indians who, who um, were full of life and uh, who made friends immediately. Um, they could also make enemies immediately, but um, they took me to heart and, and we had this wonderful Christmas party which I enjoyed with people I was meeting for the first time. So even in a lonely city, you, you can find friends if you are receptive to them. The adventure is not in getting somewhere, it's the on the way experience. It's not the expected, it's the surprise, not the fulfillment of prophecy but the providence of something better than what has been prophesied. You write this in at the end of the road. So is there a message in this for this two minute generation which is sitting out there? No, I, I don't recall having written any words of wisdom in my life. That, that doesn't sound like me at all. <laughs> Rather than hands on running after something, yes. mm -hmm. the whole journey of trying to achieve something is pro probably more pleasurable. That's right. Uh, it's the journey, not the destination, that makes, makes life very interesting. Um, and I usually contrive to get lost on, on journeys that I make, and that very often does lead to uh, some interesting episodes in, and adventures. That was a few years ago. Our Diwalis are far more respectable now. And Rekha sends us sweets instead of pakoras. But those were the days, my friend, we thought they had never end. In fact, they haven't. It's still party time in Landor and Masuri. If I were to ask you one magical thing about these two towns, Landor and Masuri, what would they be? I, I think the most common factor nowadays are the monkeys. Huh? And uh, anyone who's having a party would be the, the monkeys who come in at our windows and um, raid our kitchens. <coughs> I have a, a particular favorite monkey who comes and sometimes even sits on the foot of my bed. I think she's might have read Night Train at Dioli because she has a rather romantic look in her eyes. <laughs> and um, there, there was another one the other day who was trying to use my telephone no? and um, phone, phoning long distance to relatives. No? somewhere in the valley. 
And the third monkey um, I discovered sitting, I opened the bathroom door and the monkey was sitting on the potty, you know. And he, he wasn't actually doing anything there, but uh, he just found it a comfortable place to sit and wouldn't move and shift. So I had to bang the door several times before he took off. So that's party time in Missouri nowadays. Huh? The old days of cocktail parties are long gone. <laughs> in your writings, trains, stations, tunnels, compartments frequently find grand mention. Your, all your train journeys. Oh yes, train journeys were, were the thing back in the 1950s and 60s. We, our <clears throat> air, air service was still in their infancy. And in fact, the first time I took a plane to, to Bangalore, uh, I was violently ill because in those days you used the uh, Dakotas and um, they were not pressurized. Um, so most people traveled by train in those days and of course they still do. Uh, but uh, you do have some, if, if you're in a hurry now, you, you can take a plane. Hmm? Or if it's Missouri to Delhi, you can go by road. But the, the trains played an important part in my early stories. Um, like the woman on Platform 8, which was set in Ambala, which is now Haryana. And um, Night Train at Dioli, the tunnel, a, a number of stories were based in. So in future, are we going to see planes, lounges and airports find mention in your writings or they're just not romantic? No, they're not romantic enough, I'm afraid. <laughs> In uh, our trees still grow in Dehra, you write, once you have lived with the mountains, there is no escape. You belong to them. What is so magical about living in the hills that has inspired your writing so much? Yeah, I don't think you can really explain it, but there is something mystical, magical about uh, living in the mountains. And uh, the longer you, you live there, um, the closer you come to them, and whenever I've been away, even if, if it's for a few days, I always feel the urge to return. So I think it's, it's something about maybe the, the solitude of the mountains, the loneliness, the Devda trees, um, the simplicity of the village life, um, and the pace of life. It's slower. You're not constantly in a hurry to get somewhere has must be the case in a big city like Delhi or Mumbai where you're under pressure always huh, to to finish a, to finish a task or to something that you've undertaken the sensualist was a major departure from your writings and you almost went to jail for it in fact you know a warrant was issued what was the inspiration for this writing the sensualist no particular inspiration it I just wanted to do something different as from time to time I do, um, generally I'm a short story writer. Uh, I do the occasional short novel or novella. I write poetry, I write essays, I write lots of books for children. And The Sensualist was an erotic story which actually um, was written in about in the early 1960s. So no real life inspiration for that story? Uh, no, not in particular, no. Not every story is based on, on something that's happened to me. Although I think with, as with most writers, your characters are often drawn from people you've known and that hel helps you to give them a certain uh, reality and a certain, um, a certain form. You have written that it is just a coincidence that in the so-called developed countries, the incidence of mental illness has risen alongside the decline in reading habits and the increase in TV watching. Perhaps a book will just be another doctor's prescription for getting back to your sanity. So is reading your perception for people to be happy and cheerful? Well, reading does help, I think, you to, to recover. It's not a cure for an illness, but if it helps you on the road to recovery. And um, at various points in my life when I have been perhaps hospitalized for something or the other. I've always found it very helpful if I've got books bes beside me. Not any kind of book, but of course naturally books by the kind of writers that you enjoy reading and that you're fond of. So reading could well be prescribed by a doctor, 
for someone who's having maybe um, some mental problems too, it, it would certainly have a, I think most authors could have a, a tranquilizing effect. Okay. And some would put you to sleep too. In one of your stories, The Adventures of Rusty, you write, it is like cinema, said Koki. The window is the screen, the world is the picture. Has the new generation of children busy with their mobile phones, gaming, and augmented Pokemon forgotten to enjoy small joys of life? Is this the heavy price one has to pay for the so-called materialistic progress? Well, we can't stop materialistic progress. And um, although I don't use cell phones uh, myself, but uh, my, as everybody in my family does, so I just am, am very cunning, I'd make use of theirs because I'm particularly uh, clumsy with these things. Your novella, Flight of Pigeons, is another departure from your usual style. It's almost like a piece of history. How did it, it happen? A, I mean, this well, it is a piece of history, A Flight of Pigeons. Um, it's set in the 1857 uprising, and it, it's based on the experiences of a young girl who was of Eurasian uh, descent, and um, her father was killed in the uprising. And um, in it, I tell her story of how she survives with the help of people from different communities and backgrounds. So it, it, I set out to show that um, even in times of stress and conflict, human beings can help each other regardless of their, regardless of their differences. You have been a very lonely, a private person. Is that the reason why you found your outlet in writing? Um, no, I'm not sure. I think I wanted to be a writer even when I was a schoolboy. I wasn't a particularly lonely person at the time. Um, I, I was, in fact, uh, quite an active schoolboy. I played games. I didn't um, uh, avoid. I had friends. So, no, I think it was just my fondness for reading. I was a bookworm. I read more than anybody, anybody else. And I, in, I think I must have been in class eight or nine when I wrote a, a, short, a, a short novel, actually. And in it, I made the mistake of making fun of my classmaster, who then found my, my story in an exercise book and uh, proceeded to tear it up. So that was the end of my, my first literary effort. So any young people here who want to write books, keep your teachers out of them. Don't put them in. <laughs> your writings are delightfully laced with nostalgia, boyhood and unfinished romances. Sometimes we also get glimpses of your early period in Masuri and Landor. And there it ends. Has there been no interesting episodes in your later period in Landor or Masuri that has been interesting to write about? Well, many, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> we all have certain parts of our lives that we, we uh, prefer to keep to ourselves. You can't write about everything. In fact, authors who write autobiographies usually never tell the truth. In fact, they keep a great deal back. So it's somebody else has to come along one day and if he finds you're an interesting character, he might then write a book about you or a biography. But uh, authors are liars. They're not going to tell anything truthful about themselves in an autobiography. <laughs> they might write a good book about somebody else, but you don't confess, <laughs> at least uh, not when you're alive. Uh, which has been your favorite bookstore? Any bookshop is, is, um, is a place I like to browse in. In your writings, you mentioned when you were 12, you met Koki. And then years later, you met her as Mrs. Satish Dayal in Shamli, where her husband ran the hotel. But there is also a very strong, subtle hint of an un unfinished romance in that episode. Was Koki for real? Did you really fall in love for the first time when you were 12? I don't remember, to tell you the truth. <laughs> See, you mentioned four friends, Somi, Ranbir, Kishan and Sori. In the story, it happened one spring. Kishan later died when he was 27. Ranbir later joined the Air Force and died in a plane crash. Somi became a doctor. What happened to Kishan? Vikas knows more than I do about some of the people I've written about. 
So it's unnec not necessary for me to tell you even. <laughs> um, but uh, there they are. Some of those characters are still alive and some aren't. What is about those big cities that doesn't interest you? About the big cities that doesn't interest you, because it's all the small cities that you… Uh... No, big cities have their… have their charm. Big cities are full of stories, as O. Henry found out when he lived in New York. Um, small towns also have their stories. I think the difference is perhaps that in a… in a small town, you get to know everybody, your neighbors, people living down the street. Whereas in a big city, the people you get to know well are perhaps those you work with or those you study with or those you live with. So there are subtle differences, but I think there are, there are stories everywhere. And if you're interested in people, you won't run out of stories. Um, everyone has a story to tell. And nowadays with, with the surge in in um, young people wanting to write and um, I'm constantly meeting um, youngsters who want to write books or who have written books or, or who are, are planning to write books or who are looking for publishers and so many writers I only feel sometimes that maybe we need more readers too because um, if you write a book it's nice to have somebody read it. Hmm? <laughs> so it, it's, it's um, uh, my only ad advice to young writers is think in terms of, of getting your book published by someone who will give it a good promotion and distribution and for that you need to go to a, um, an experienced and um, reliable publisher whereas if you self-publish, spend your own money on publishing a book it can be very self-defeating because the publisher might well be quite happy to deliver you, you know, 500 copies on your doorstep and, uh, and then you're stuck with them. You just have to give them away to friends because to, to get a book read, it has to go into, into bookshops or be available uh, online or, or so people have to know about it. Hmm? Uh, and so if, if you just publish yourself, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. Hmm? So I would always uh, suggest that you, after all, a book should bring you something when it's published. You should get a royalty, you should get something coming back to you hmm? and not have to be paying out of your hard-earned savings. Hmm? Um, so don't be in a hurry to publish. Hmm? Take your time over the writing the book, over editing it and then Look for a good publisher and if, if you do that, you have a much better chance of success. Yeah. I've deviated from your question, but <laughs> yeah. See, there is so much of negativity, hatred, crime in the world around us, yet not, none of this seem to have crept in your writings. So how are you able to maintain this balance in an age where there is so much of negativity all around? Well, I don't know. Maybe my next book will be full of negativity. <laughs> I don't know. And all the things that I haven't been writing about. <laughs> Uh, but um, I do, um, I, I perhaps have, it's a weakness on my part, I, I do like to see the, the positive rather than the negative in people. You have always enjoyed movies. Uh, any recent movie apart from Vishal Bharadwaj movie that you would have really enjoyed watching? No, I, I haven't um, seen anything very recently, that's true. Okay, we will now take a few questions from the audience. Uh, Yes, please do um, uh, ask me anything you like to do in connection with books or writing or, or living in Delhi or Missouri for that matter. It's quite a treat to, be, uh, to get to listen to you live like this. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know uh, your uh, thoughts on why is it that children's literature in India, and this is coming because you're known so much for the kind of quality children's literature that you've produced, why is it that children's literature as a genre in India has not really gone to respectable standards? Respectable in terms of, uh, you know, my wanting uh, a better word for it, but uh, it's not really seen as a very viable genre in creative writing, in India specifically. 
I, I see. I see what you mean. And um, for many years, children's writing was neglected here, and publishers were reluctant actually to publish children's books. I think also a lot of many writers were reluctant to write for children because they felt they wouldn't be taken seriously, right. or they wouldn't. Their books wouldn't get reviewed. They still don't get reviewed. Education hadn't spread as widely or as rapidly as it has in the last 10 or 15, 20 years. So the, the market for children's books was a very limited one. And we were all inclined to read children's books that had come in from abroad. That has been changing gradually. And I know there are more and more writers and some very good ones writing for children. And um, also, I think it's up to adults, uh, parents, teachers, to perhaps encourage the reading of children's books in their schools and their homes. And, uh, and that would, I think, help, help a great deal. But certainly things, times have changed. And um, there are now publishers who have particular special sections for, like Puffin with Penguin yeah. Books or, mm, or Scholastic and others, who are concentrating on books for children. There was a time when Mr. Shankar Pillay was alive and his Children's Book Trust was doing very good work in this area. Mm -hmm. But uh, over the years, it seems to have, uh, you know, died a kind of a natural death. Mm -hmm. And now, apart from Puffin, you can't really think of any other leading publisher foraying into this market. No, th no, there are more publishers coming into it. But you're right. I mean, I, my first children's book was in fact published with Children's Book Trust uh, when yeah. Mr. Shankar was, right. was alive. Yeah. And um, that one is still in print, mm -hmm. but it's in print now with, with Pan Puffin right. and Penguin. Uh, so it's a pity that maybe it's gone into decline. I think they do still publish books. Huh? Um, but I think it's also a lot to do with, with marketing. Hmm? I know book, bookshops that hesitate to take books published by, say, the NBT or the Children's Book Trust because the margin of profit is very small. Mm? Because children's books can't be too expensive in any case. Mm? So in the end, it all boils down to money. <laughs> well, yes, you see the, the success of the Harry Potter books a few years back did change the face of things. And um, publishers began to take children's books more seriously when they found they could make money with them and can make money with them. In fact, my children's books sell better than my adult books. <laughs> they do. Hi, uh, good evening, sir. So my name is Amit and I'm from Dehradun. I had a wonderful time meeting you at your residence. I had a tea with you. I can never forget. I've never met a humble person like you. And you are my favorite author. Uh, whenever I come from office and very tired, I read a phrase, a phrase from your book. Hmm. And I get a lot of relief because your book has great sense of humor. I don't know from where it comes and from, but most of your book has it. And I, no matter how tired and you know how tension I am in, but after reading it, I, there's a smile on my face. So just th would like to thank you for that. The question is, sir, uh, a long time back, I don't know, uh, when you took the decision uh, to uh, shift to mountains in Mussoorie from Delhi, uh, and you decided, no, whatever happens, I'll write and we'll take this path forward. Uh, many of us actually, you know, want to do something, but uh, don't, don't find courage many times. Uh, so how difficult was you for, for at that point? And what's your advice to manage the fear and actually do what you want to do? Uh, not getting, you know, uh, sunk in, in, in other jobs which you don't like. Thank you. Well, <coughs> first... Thank you for your kind words. Flattery will get you everywhere in life. <laughs> so, so come again and next time I'll give you more than a cup of tea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but as for, as for taking the risk of going up and living in the hills, at the time it was a risk, but um, I felt I had to do it. I, I had been in the 1960s living in Delhi for four or five years. Part of the time I had a job and I wanted to write full time and uh, give myself up entirely to writing. And I thought 
living in the hills would be the right sort of um, environment for that. So I gave up a good job, but um, but I'd already, in a way, est established my name as a writer. So it wasn't too difficult continuing from that uh, from that point. Hmm? Um, and it was the move was, uh, in a way, a good one uh, because I. I think I wrote, started writing better, you know, living in a more natural environment. And, um, but it's not just that. I think in India itself, writing came of age, publishing came of age. We didn't have many publishers around in the, in, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And um, so I had to write a lot for the magazines, newspapers, which is why a lot of my work is short stories, you know, and, and um, essays. And I put all these together in books over a period of time. And it's only in the 1980s, let's say, that publishers from abroad came into India and our own publishers, like Rupa and others, also expanded. And um, so it, it became possible to make a decent living from writing. And today you see so many young writers or even middle-aged writers from, say, Chetan Bhagat to Amish Tripathi and all making huge sums of money from their books. Hmm? I mean, ten times more than I would make. Uh, but because that means that there is a readership for, for certain kinds of books, for their kinds of books, or you have to look for that readership. Hmm? And um, so it is quite possible now uh, to make a good living from writing in India Whereas 30, 40 years ago, a writer had to go, had to look abroad for a publisher. So in many respects, things have changed and it's, I've gone a long way from <laughs> moving into the hills, but uh, uh, in a way that was the beginning of it for me. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, my question is basically about the relationship that cinema shares with literature and vice versa. Over the years in the West, this trend has picked up where uh, more or less the bestsellers and other literary works are sooner or later adapted into big films. But why do you think that trend hasn't picked up so well in a country like India? Yes, I, not only in India. You see, back in the 40s and 50s, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, great films were in fact based on literary works. I mean, you had Dickens's um, Oliver Twist and Great Expectations and others made into very fine films. And other authors were, were particularly um, popular with film directors like Somerset Maugham with films like Of Human Bondage and others. Or Daphne du Maurier mm, with uh, Rebecca and Frenchman's Creek. Uh, so many writers were, their work was very suitable for um, adaptation. Now I think uh, not now in the West too, it's more a question of screenplays and scripts being written specially for films. And I think that it's almost always been the case here too, with a few, few exceptions. Huh? You see, most of our great writers in the past, for Tagore and Premchand and all, I mean, they were writing when we didn't have a film industry. So, but whereas a present day writer could, even when he's writing a novel, very might very well have a a film in mind when he's writing it. I've never had a film in mind when writing, but I'm a very visual writer and I think I was influenced a lot by the fact that as a boy I was, I used to go to every film that I could see. Before I sit down to write it, I visualize it. I see it like a, like a short film, you know, it's a short. And, it, and that had, that's very helpful because then I don't get writer's block, you know, because I see the story from beginning to end. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for that answer. Uh, good evening. My name is Sushruti. And uh, I had a question for you, sir. You gave us really sound advice to young writers about how to go about publishing and to not self-publish. But is there a key piece of advice that you would give to young authors on how to write, how to begin writing and improve the quality? That would be really nice. Certainly, um, because uh, I would always urge you to, a young writer, to First of all, respect the language you're writing in, whether it's English or Hindi or your own regional language, because it's not enough just to rattle off a story or put your views down on paper. You, know, you, you must also use language to good effect and, and try to write in as well as you can. 
you know, and so I don't say you've got to be too, too strict about grammar, and, but it does help if you can write a good sentence hmm, and also um, take some trouble with, uh, with words. And, and, um, and I think the best thing to do that is, is to be a reader. And uh, if you look at all the, the great writers in the world f f over the last hundred years, you'll find that as ch children or when they were young, they, they read a lot, they were readers. So you learn to write from other writers, basically. Hmm? And, um, and unless you do that, you, you will always, I think, fall short hmm, of being a good writer hmm, if you don't have that, uh, that grasp of language hmm, uh, with you. So language is all important. And then after that, a certain amount of creativity, inventiveness, the ability to create characters, um, to tell a story, to, um, and to, to work hard too. And, uh, because it, it, it's hard work also sometimes, uh, writing a, a book or a story or a novel.